Eco Money on Money FM 89.3. This is Eco Money on Money FM 89.3 with me, Rachel Kelly. Singapore listed Capital Land Invest portfolio spans the globe. The real estate investment player has operations in more than 40 countries and more than 200 cities. And with such a significant global footprint, it's no surprise that it's keeping an eye on a different footprint. Its carbon footprint. CLI recently refreshed its sustainability master plan, integrating its 2050 net zero carbon emissions commitment. To find out more, I spoke with Mr. Vinamra Srivastava, CLI's chief sustainability officer. So let's take a look at some of these refreshed commitments. CLI is aiming to increase its use of renewable energy to 45% by 2030. That's up from your previous goal of 35%. Can you share with us more on your renewable energy mix and how exactly are you going to achieve that goal? Yeah, you're right. Renewable is a very key lever in our decarbonization strategy. I mean, today, uh, based on the last report that we released, uh, our, our renewable coverage is around 5% across the entire portfolio. Uh, having said that, uh, this actually uh, is a result of very strong efforts that we've been doing across our geographies and asset classes. So, you know, as of last year, uh, 26 properties in seven of our countries um, and 10 business parks in India were either fully or partially powered by renewable. Um, and we have multiple success stories that highlight this. So Singapore, for example, uh, has natural limitations on how much renewable you can put in, but we have very strong efforts on on-site renewable. So we have more than 45,000 square meters of uh, rooftop that is covered in solar panels in Singapore. Uh, India has been a fantastic success story for us. Uh, uh, in India today, almost 40% of our total electricity is generated uh, through either on-site or off-site power purchase agreements from renewable uh, providers. Our, our Ascot business in India has 90, more than 90% of the electricity uh, for our service residences being powered from an off-site uh, wind farm. So in effect, even though we are a very complex organization with portfolio in, uh, in 30 countries across different asset classes, and renewable is a sector where different countries have different uh, regulatory challenges. But despite that, we do recognize that this is a key area for us. So the focus now is in every geography to double down on uh, two efforts. One is maximize what renewables we can put on site. So for example, of course, covering our rooftops with solar panels, but even looking at new technologies that can be deployed uh, on site through innovation. For example, we are testing out micro wind turbines on rooftops. Uh, we are trying out waste to energy solutions uh, on site. Uh, so there are multiple technologies. We, we're trying out technologies to improve efficiency of existing solar panels, et cetera. So, so mm -hmm. that's on site. And then in parallel, we are looking to get into new uh, power purchase agreements with offsite renewable farms. So wherever possible to continue to expand our coverage. So it is a, it is an ambitious challenge but it is a must uh, and an integral part of our strategy. Therefore, we are quite confident that we'll get there. And what are some of the challenges when it comes to retrofitting these buildings or the buildings within your portfolio so that they're able to integrate these kind of renewables into the energy mix for the buildings? Every building, uh, depending on the asset class, is very different, mm -hmm. right? Uh, their vintage is different. The layout and design is different. For example, many of the buildings were built multiple years back, decades back, right? And at that time, probably the designs did not allow for much space on the rooftop to put panels. And a lot of the mechanical and electrical equipment, you can't now replace them or, or move them around. So then how do you deal with such challenges, right? Uh, similarly, in many places, the grid infrastructure may not be uh, conducive or suitable enough to be able to, uh, to connect to all your properties uh, in, in the same grid uh, locations, right? When it comes to off-site power purchase agreements, a lot of times you also have to look at the commercial viability of the agreements. Is ultimately the cost of landed power going to be cheaper or more expensive than, um, than the previous case? And, and there is no right or wrong answer in each of these cases. So even if, let's say, in some cases, uh, financially, the, the returns may take slightly longer to re-benefits, 
but we know that it, it's still going to increase my renewable percentage, uh, we may go ahead and take that call. So it really depends uh, on a case by case basis on how do we deal with some of these challenges. And at the end of the day, the solutions lie around creating the right technology set, creating the right business model, working with the partners, working with regulators to uh, make this happen. You mentioned waste conversion as well. And I know one of the other goals that you've got in the report is to reduce waste intensity in daily operations by 20%. Can you give us a better understanding of how exactly you're planning to do this? Is this, as you mentioned, deficiency as well? So maybe, you know, ironing out some inefficiencies to improve things. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Again, twofold approach. One is to minimize the generation of waste in the first place. Uh, And that has a lot to do with um, education, awareness, uh, the right opportunities for people to sort the waste at source itself. Uh, But a bulk of it is about improving the, uh, the recycling process and technologies, right? So this is where we really leverage the power of innovation across the different geographies. And I'll give you some examples that will showcase to you how we're approaching this, right? So in India, for example, we have recently implement, uh, implemented a fully automated waste segregation system. It's called TrashPot. What it does is um, you put in all your parks waste in there. It will separate it into biodegradable and non-biodegradable. The biodegradable part further gets into uh, organic waste composters and the result of that is compost that we can use back in landscaping. In India, we have large parks which have very huge landscaping. So all the composting and the fertilizer requirements can come from that. And then the non-biodegradable part can can then get converted into um, things like pellets, et cetera, which can be recycled and reused again in different forms of furniture, pots, or even just, um, you know, uh, shared with external parties. So end of the day, we try to consume all the waste that we are generating within the park um, within uh, within the park premises and our operations as well. Let's take Singapore as an example. So we have got um, organic uh, or other food waste uh, compost or food waste digest, as they call it here. Uh, and we are doing two management trials of it in two of our sh- shopping malls, Funan and Tampanese Mall. People are familiar with these malls. Uh, so what they do is in Funan, for example, we install the food waste uh, biodigester. It converts the raw and cooked, fed, uh, cooked food into gray water. Uh, and compost, and it doesn't use any chemicals in that. And and therefore, through that aerobic process, it's very environment friendly, uh, and it accelerates the decomposition in a very natural way, right? We're also trying another technology through our global innovation challenge called uh, called TrashPot, where it's going to help in improving the recycling rate, and especially reduce the contamination of recycling matters. I mean, in Singapore, contamination of recycling material is a very critical issue. Uh, I talked about waste to energy. So one of the solutions that we are trialing from a global innovation challenge is a solution which um, converts organic biomass or even plastic waste into on-site renewable electricity and thermal power, right? And these are sort of housed in a container that you can put on site and and feed in waste and it gets connected uh, to the to the grid if needed or supply your own local power needs. So through all these examples, the focus is whether it's a mall or an office building or or whichever asset class, but technology does have the power to continue to improve your recycling rates. And this gets balanced with, uh, with education uh, and improving processes and design of your systems to just generate less waste uh, in the first place. So it's really all hands on deck and you've got to try multiple levers at the same time. And these, are, I mean, they're great initiatives, but as you said, mindset change that's needed. I think uh, somebody was talking about the plastic recycling statistic in Singapore. I think it's still shockingly low at <laughs> single digits. Um, so what are some of the challenges that you face as a real estate investment company when it comes to working with your teams to implement these projects. Buy-in is really critical, isn't it, to ensure the project is successful, especially if it's something new, something innovative that hasn't been done before. It is. You're absolutely right. Look, sustainability is an area where everybody's learning on the go, Mm. Uh, whether it's private companies, um, governments, um, regulators. I think everybody's learning from each other to get better. So, That also means that you don't have silver bullets. You don't have benefits of hindsight. You don't have proven models that could work. 
what you need to do is continue to chip at it um, step by step by trying out different solutions, different models, be willing to fail, uh, and over time, of course, improve your success rate. So as an organization, you're right, getting buy-in from all stakeholders, uh, not in terms of why we are doing this, because I think we're at a stage where that is very clear, but buy-in from stakeholders on how we should be decarbonizing our portfolio, because there could be different ways of, of going towards the same target. So how to do that in a way that is consistent with our corporate strategy and allows for enough flexibility in the macro environment, right? So that's one. The other part is because we are so diverse in terms of geographies and asset classes, again, there is no one size fit all solution to decarbonization itself in terms of technologies. So we have to mix and match something that works in, let's say, a mall in Singapore may not necessarily work in an office building in Europe, for example, right? So how do you then balance your, your different toolkits like a Swiss Army knife and then um, work uh, based on the local context on what is suitable for that particular context? And that needs a lot of agility and, and flexibility in mindset uh, as an organization itself, right? The other challenge is, uh, is of course, balancing between achieving sustainability leadership and uh, financial returns. The misconception that achieving sustainability targets comes at a financial cost um, that cannot be paid back. And, and I don't think that is indeed the case. Of course, there will be areas where sometimes financial returns take longer. But if you, if you look at it holistically, today we have enough technologies out there that are proven that will ensure that there is a fine balance that corporates can make between achieving sustainability goals and their financial uh, objectives. Let's take real estate, for example, very quick examples, right? I invest in improving the energy efficiency of a building, which can effectively improve operational efficiencies, reduce my utility bills, uh, and therefore my operating expenditure goes down. When that happens, the value of my building increases, right? So very direct correlation. Let's take another example. If I have a building that is not green enough and my nearby building is greener than mine, high likelihood that tenants may prove to may choose to go to a greener building than my building. So therefore, I have a very high opportunity cost. It may take me longer to lease the building. Increasingly, we are beginning to see tenants who are also willing to holistically consider uh, paying a slight premium, not only because your building is greener, but because it is also from a wellness perspective, more conducive to the health of the employees, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, and therefore you can enjoy those benefits as well. So even financially leasing the buildings at attractive terms is easier if a building is, uh, is greener, right? Take the risk of stranded assets over a period of time. If you do not invest in greening your assets, there will come a time where some of your buildings may become stranded. Uh, and by stranded, I mean, they may not fetch you the right value. They may even depreciate in value. Uh, and you may not even have a buyer in, in extreme cases. So we take sustainability linked loans, for example, right? So a lot of sustainable financing, if you perform well on the KPIs, you get interest rate savings. So again, there's a financial benefit. So I think the industry has to come out of this perception and myth that it's either or. I can either financially make money for my shareholders or I can go and save the planet. And the reality is increasingly there is a middle ground. We must be careful of how we tread that middle ground, but that is where the right strategy and the right focus comes in. And that is where you have to prioritize based on materiality of issues and therefore invest in the right areas that continue to move the needle towards both your sustainability goals and making financial sense. That was Mr. Vinamra Srivastava, Capital Land Invest Chief Sustainability Officer. I'm Rachel Kelly, and you've been listening to Eco Money on Money FM 89.3.